how we think that we're being perceived and how we're actually being perceived might be different. And so getting clarity on how we're perceived is mm. an important part of this equation. Welcome to the Happy Engineer podcast, the place where we help engineers like you to build your career, balance your life, and be happy. I'm Zach White, former engineer turned lifestyle engineering coach and your host for the journey to the career and life that you desire. Hey, I believe that you shouldn't have to sacrifice your life to reach your full potential at work. And what we're gonna bring you in these conversations and interviews are the strategies, the tools, and the mindsets that are gonna allow you to experience both success at work and success at home. Hey, we do the best we can to keep this free from advertisements. Of course, I can't control what YouTube may throw up, but do us a favor and share this podcast with anybody who you think may like it. And don't forget to click the bell and subscribe and get notifications to our YouTube channel and for upcoming releases of the Happy Engineer podcast. I would love your feedback and even more than that, love your story. Share with us how these strategies and tools are working for you. Would love to be in touch with you. Connect with us on social media. Find me at Oasis of Courage on Instagram, Facebook, or Zach White on LinkedIn. It's an absolute pleasure to serve you. Now let's do this. I am here with the amazing Lauren Herring. Lauren, thank you so much for making time to be with us on the Happy Engineer podcast. I just can't wait for this conversation and appreciate you making time to be on the show. Absolutely. So glad to be here, Zach. Thank you. So Lauren, you have been CEO of Impact Group for over 13 years, just living and breathing personal and professional development, career growth. Like This is your zone of genius to empower people in finding and growing the careers that they love, which is absolutely amazing. And 20 plus years in the organization. But I couldn't help but notice that before that, there was one little year of experience that didn't match up with Impact Group doing program management at the Puerto Rico Center for Social Concerns. And I was just like, wow, I wonder what was going on there in Puerto Rico. So Lauren, will you take us back to 2020? Uh, sorry, the year 2000. And what was going on in Puerto Rico? Wow, didn't expect to start here today, Zach. You you did throw me a curveball, but this is a fun one. And it's related to my passion of making a positive difference. And I'm blessed that I get to do that every day in my job at Impact Group. And I was able to do that for a year in a very different capacity during my first year after college, I graduated from the University of Notre Dame, and rather than going straight into a career path where I would be on some sort of a train to career success or whatever the case would be, I said, I want to take a year and I want to do something different. And I chose to do a year of service. I was a volunteer for the Center for Social Concerns in Puerto Rico. It's based off of similar kinds of Peace Corps, you know, various kinds sure. of nonprofit or uh, volunteer organizations. And as a business major, I was a marketing major. I didn't, I knew I wanted to do something where I would be able to be of service and help others. I also knew that I really was not super excited about the idea of teaching English. And that's what a lot of people do in those kinds of situations. And I said, okay, well, what else is out there? And I found this organization where I was able to work with individuals who were interested in starting small businesses. And I wrote business plans for them in Spanish. And nice. I put the financial projections together. And then I was partnered with a local bank and a nonprofit organization that would funnel these opportunities in. 
And it was a really incredible opportunity to essentially be doing what I had been doing all my time during business school, where I was writing business plans, putting projections together, doing yeah. case studies, that kind of thing. And I was doing it in the real world with small businesses. I helped someone get the financing together to buy a tow truck, and they make actually really good money. Who knew? Uh, maybe if you had your car towed recently, you are aware of that. Yeah. Um, we're, but, we're funding uh, that business <laughs> when our cars <laughs> break down. Uh, wow. a, a, a catering company, you know, small businesses in an economically challenged area in San Juan. And it was a very special opportunity really fueled my passion for international involvement. I love learning and growing in my Spanish language skills. So that was really a great opportunity. Uh, and then being able to make a difference. And I'm still in touch with some of those people today. That's super cool. Now, did you speak any Spanish before you went? Yes, I have been taking Spanish. A lot of times I get asked if I have Spanish background. I don't. I have been taking Spanish since seventh grade and I did it all through high school and all through okay. college and I did okay. a year abroad in Spain. So I had very proficient Spanish, uh, but you know, living and working and breathing it is a very different sure. experience. So there, there was still plenty of challenges along the way. Uh, one of my most fun years, also one of my most challenging years, but so glad I did it. And it was one of the experiences actually that... Soon after coming back to the United States, starting a, quote, career, that I realized there's no train to get on that sometimes I think young people might have in their mindset about, like, I've got to start this, so then I can do this, and then I can get promoted, and then I can get this. It's like, this is a journey, and your journey is your own, and that was an, a learning and an experience for me because there's a period where I was like, oh, if I stay another year, am I going to be too far behind, you know, some of my peers? I would say it was a few years after really getting into my career that I reassessed. And I was like, you know what? Everyone's journey is, is what it is. And what can you learn from it? How can you grow from it? And how can you make sure that you're being true to yourself and you're clear about what you want. You know, that's, those are some of the key things that I learned and took away from that time as well. Lauren, you mentioned this really deeply connected with your passion of being in service and helping people. And I'm curious, where was that born in you? Is there any time or just something about your childhood that you could point to and say, this is when I really discovered that that was a passion of mine? This passion is part of who I am, and I would attribute that to my parents, really. My parents are all about making a difference. They were teachers early in their career, also very much wanting to focus on making a positive difference. Uh, back in the day, probably the, the type of hippies that didn't have a whole lot of recreational drug use, but like maybe the mentality was there, at least as far as I know. And also, growing up in my church, probably went from the time I was in middle school on, we would occasionally get up early, like 5 a.m. As a, as a young person that felt very early, to go cook breakfast uh, once or twice a month at a homeless shelter. Um, you know, so it was part of my spiritual upbringing. It was part of my family desire to make a difference. And then Impact Group, which I have the great uh, fortune to lead right now, is also very much, you know, we're focused on making a positive difference in people's lives. And so my mom, who founded the company in 1988, wow. again, you know, for her, it was the same story of being able to recognize that there are people that have challenges, especially related to careers and finding jobs in a unique circumstance, especially. And at that time, we were very much focused on corporate relocation and helping spouses of people relocating uh, find work in the new area. And so very focused on making a positive difference. So again, it, it comes down to family and values Yes. And I'm, I'm able to be really integrating all of that in, in my work and my personal beliefs today, too. I love that. I, I want to go back to the comment you made a second ago about there is no train to get on. It's not that you You're graduate. You're not going to miss the train. It, yes, yes. And that really 
just strikes me, it resonates for me, Lauren, because I do think that I subconsciously, at least, if not very consciously, believe that there is a train and if it leaves the station, I'm going to miss out. My career isn't going to grow the way I want it to. I won't earn what I want to. Opportunities won't be available to me. You know, if I don't land that dream job right out of college, then I won't land one. There were a lot of things that created fear around that and pressure to to get on that train and stay on it. And yep. I'm curious, it's obvious you have discovered that's not the case, but why is that such a prevalent belief system or mindset that people hold about how careers are made? I think our culture values this nonstop action, get going, move forward. If you're not moving forward, you're failing and It's up to us as individuals who are in control of our own careers, as well as people maybe teaching our children, as well as leaders in organizations to to be asking people about what is it that you want? How can I help you accomplish that? And then I would say the other piece is that how can we both own some of that, Uh, especially in an organization and as a leader? How can you help someone accomplish what they want? But then the other piece that's really important in the whole career equation is recognizing what parts do you need to own as well? Because no one is in charge of your career except for you. And if you want to get things moving to the next level, then what new skills are you bringing to the table? What new effort are you going to bring forward so that you're an obvious choice? We all know that in today's world, length of tenure is not going to suffice for getting to that next level. So I know I've strayed a little bit from your question here, but it comes back together because no, there's no train where you've missed out if you haven't gotten on the train. But on the other hand, it is important for you to take ownership of what parts you need to be doing in order to move things forward in your career. To answer that question, Lauren, would you be able to articulate, you know, like what are the top two, three, four things when you're coaching your clients and, and leaders on how to break through and build careers? Where do we need to begin in terms of that ownership? What are the the key areas to focus. I mean, I know for me, it's like, okay, cool. I'll, I need to know what I need to own. Well, can you help me figure it out? What are those places? I always start from a place of clarity because a lot of times people figure like, hey, I want to be moving forward in my career, but okay, well, what do you want? Do you want to be CEO? Do you want to get to the next level? Do you want to make sure that you're having work-life balanced? Are you fine with working like a maniac and you know, to heck with... work-life balance. So make sure that you're really clear on what you want, both personally and professionally. So I always look at it like you can't necessarily look at your career goals apart from your personal goals. So for example, I'm married to a man where we have a daughter from his previous marriage. Relocation is not on the table in my relationship. But if I worked at a big company where if I needed to move up in order, move around in order to move up, then that would not be the right place for me, most likely. So, you know, keeping those pieces not exclusive from each other is important. So, you know, making sure that you understand what are your personal goals, what are your professional goals, and, you know, how can you get those in alignment? And I've talked to plenty of people, even CEOs who said, I didn't start out thinking I was going to be a CEO. Now, mind you, I've talked to other CEOs who knew exactly from high school that they were going to be CEOs. So it's okay to be in both of those camps. Can you at least start to look out three to five years in your career so you can see what the next one or two steps are for you? And then that can also help you understand what are some of the things that you need to be learning and growing and developing so that you can get to that next level and be strategic about uh, the choices that you make in your career and development. So category one, you're responsible and you own deep clarity around the goal in every area, the whole life picture. I love that. What else, where do we need to step up and take ownership when it comes to career growth? 
The next area that I often encourage people to focus on is around personal brand. And for an engineer, I don't know if this concept is something that is really innate. So then, you know, how can we break it down really clear? Because we're not talking about just your resume. We're not talking about just your LinkedIn profile. We're not talking about you as a brand like Nike. That's too gray area for us. Uh, so what I like to think about it is how do you clearly articulate the value that you bring to an organization? And I look at that in a couple different directions uh, because it's not only about how can you communicate that to your network, to your boss, to the person you're interviewing with. Of course, we want to do that. That's you know obvious if you're looking to grow your career. But the place to start with that honestly, is inside. And when you can own who you are at your best, the value that you bring an organization, that's when I am so excited when someone can connect with that really well, because the level of confidence that brings mm. themselves, it, it almost becomes like a career superpower, if you will, because that's where you know, like, this is where I need to be spending my time. This is my superpower. Okay, how can I grow that to the next level? So I focus on personal brand, both from getting clear on that yourself. And then, of course, how can you really clearly articulate that simply? You know, you don't need a 30-second commercial where you're going on and on and on and on and on. And then someone can't remember what it is that you actually do. This point, Lauren, I really connect with because I remember in my own career at Whirlpool Corp, when I went through a workshop where we crafted you know, a, a personal brand message, so to speak. How do you articulate your value, what you're saying? And I remember coming out of that, I had this statement and it was kind of like, wow, this is the first time that I can actually articulate in a short, concise, simple way some of what made me unique and differentiated in the organization and the value that my role created and then my vision and where I wanted to go. And you mentioned confidence. I didn't realize how much my own self-confidence was being impacted. My self-esteem was being impacted by not being able to articulate that. You know, if I'm not clear on what I'm worth, how am I going to you know, ever share that with others? And it, it actually changed uh, changed the game in a big way to be able to say that. So, you know, I hope everybody listening just recognizes this might be a blind spot where if you feel like self-confidence or self-esteem is an issue, to begin with seeking clarity in what you're talking about here is a great step. I mean, Lauren, do you see that with your clients as well? Absolutely. And sometimes these brand and clarity pieces can go hand in hand as well. So they might feed off of each other and one of the things that I really encourage people to do in this process is to not necessarily do it in a vacuum. Go to people that know you, that you trust. It could be a manager. It could be a direct report. It could be a peer. It could be a client. Lots of different directions you can go and ask in terms of what are some of my strengths? Do I have any blind spots? You know, sometimes, especially if you're asking this up the chain, you can be asking things along the lines of, if I want to get to the next level, which I believe I do, then what are some things that you feel like I need to make sure that I'm exhibiting and understand what your level of competency there versus what's required? Sometimes how we think that we're being perceived and how we're actually being perceived might be different. And so getting clarity also on how we're perceived is mm. an important part of this equation. So going to people that you trust to get some information on how do you see me? What are some of my extra special strengths? Where am I performing? Uh, what can you always count on that you're going to get from me? So, you know, mm. there's a handful of questions. Um, you know, I'm the go-to person for what? you know, see how you're perceived from others. And that can help with this process as well. I love that. And I can say from clients I coach, Lauren, a lot of people don't have that trusted group that they go to and ask those questions, either for fear of what may happen if they do, or frankly, just have never been proactive to go and engage in that way. So that's a really great reminder. Is there anything else that's really different that 
you would say, hey, you also need to own this. So we, we talked about clarity and personal brand. Is there anything else you would point to? The other piece, and this is really critical for your engineering audience, Zach, that's around your network, your corporate visibility. And sometimes this might not be an innate, comfortable place to be focusing on, but how do you make sure that you're building the right relationships to make sure to progress your career? I interviewed someone on my podcast, Take Control of Your Career, the other day, and she said it beautifully. Her name is Stephanie Chung. She is uh, the chief growth officer for Wheels Up uh, Private Aviation Airlines. And she said, every important conversation about your career that's going to be career defining about what's going to happen to your career, you're not there. <laughs> so other people are having these conversations about your career. And so you need to make sure that other people are aware of the value you bring to the organization and what you want. Wow. The critical conversations about the future of your career are happening when you're not there. <laughs> that is a really eye-opening statement and so true. The, the door is closed when it's time to have that talent pool discussion about your future. And if you're not being proactive with those relationships so they know what you want, how can you expect to get it? So Lauren, you're right. Stereotypically, engineers don't love the word networking. Some of my clients are naturals at it, but many of them dread this part of career growth and they don't look forward to the people side of our coaching conversation. So what would you say if you're breaking it down to the most important aspects of networking for career growth, what does that look like? I happen to have a number of ideas on this. In my book, Take Control of Your Job Search, this is actually an area that I focus on because there is so much emotion wrapped up in the whole concept yes. of networking. And in that book, I really dissect the various emotions that go on in a job search. But you know, it's the same thing in career growth in general, whether you're looking for a job or trying to grow your career internally. And one of the things that I talk about is reframing. Our brains are so focused on the words that we use. So for example, instead of calling it networking, which has a schmoozy, maybe to your audience negative connotation. Yeah. What if we call it reconnecting and you reach out to former colleagues that you've worked with at former jobs, you reach out to people that you went to college with, you reach out to people that you go to church or synagogue with. It doesn't necessarily have to be schmoozing. It's really about people to people having honest conversations like we're having right now. I mean, we're just chatting. Yes. We happen to be recorded and go through that whole process, but we're also just having a conversation. And that's really what networking is about. So if you can reframe it into about reconnecting and maybe for people that you don't know, just new, learning about new people and being genuinely interested in connecting with people, yes. that's one thing. And then the other piece is how can we move away from the concept, the fear-based concept that if I ask someone for something that, you know, I'm really going out there on a limb. Because the, the reality is, I think in most cases, people want to help, people want to be kind. And yes. especially if you have a relationship, it's no sweat to make an introduction to somebody. So think about it if the shoe's on the other foot. If someone, if this same person asked you for an introduction to someone that you would like to know, then you'd probably say yes is my guess. So you'll know, think about it in that way as well. I love that. I routinely pose the question to my engineering leaders that I coach. If a junior engineer, someone who just joined your organization came to you and just said, hey, would, would you be willing to give me 20 minutes? Anytime you're free, I know you're busy. I just have a few questions about how you built your career to the level that you're at, because I really admired your career path. How would that question make you feel? And all of them say, oh, I would, I'd be happy to. I love to do that. It's a pleasure. It's a privilege to be able to share yep. those things with them. And then you turn around and say, well, how many times have you gone to those senior directors and VPs in your organization and posed the same question? 
Oh, I don't want to bother anyone. I oh, they don't do have that. time for me. I wouldn't ever do that. I don't know what I would say to them. I don't know what questions I would ask. And completely unable to flip that script and recognize those VPs and the CTO and those people. But yes, they're busy. Their calendars are full, but they also have the same human heart that you have to want to help you and, and create the opportunity to support others. So ask. And not only that, the other thing that I'll add to that is, aside from the human piece of it, is that those senior executives a lot of times don't have visibility deeper into the organization that your clients might have. And they are loving the opportunity to learn about fresh talent, talent that's motivated, talent that wants to learn and grow. So if you can make sure that you're going in with very thoughtful questions and demonstrating to a, a senior leader about, again, the value you're bringing to the organization, chances are they're going to be really excited to be aware of top talent that they didn't even know was there. I love that. I love that. I I sometimes talk about leading with generosity and, and giving value in a networking conversation. Oftentimes people ask, well, what value could I give to somebody above me in the org chart? And that's a great example, Lauren. They want access to the, the questions and the thoughts and the things that you're seeing at your level. So mm -hmm. that's really neat. Okay. Networking engineers. Engineers oftentimes, Lauren, are considered a bit of a special breed inside the organization. And so I'm just kind of curious, what do you think? Are they the same as everyone else or, or where are they different? What's your perspective in, in serving so many clients across every sector and, and every industry? What do you think about engineers? Are we, are we different? Well, Zach, we're all the same and we're all different. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Good, so, good engineering answer. It depends. <laughs> it depends. Uh, a special kind of networking that many of us have partaken in is dating. Many years ago, I went on a date with an engineer and I live in St. Louis. So this young man was an engineer at Boeing and yeah, he was a little quirky, but kind of cute. And so I'm like, okay, well, this is, we'll see where this goes. And so I, I was like, tell me about what you do. And he tells me how his job is classified. And, but, you know, I can tell you that you know, I work on stealth technology. And he went about that deep into it, which is about all of my business brain could handle. And then, of course, what's the joke that I make? Well, you could tell me, but then you'd have to kill me. And then he says, no, really, I just can't tell you. So <laughs> if you want to know how some engineering yeah. brains work, <laughs> yes. that's an example of someone who really takes it Very seriously literal. to the letter of the law. <laughs> Okay, it was a joke. Yes, I understand you're not going to tell me. So um, anyway, uh, we all work differently. The thing that I would focus a little bit relating to this question in a serious way is that a lot of times engineers are going to be more concrete, more black and white, you know, where there is a right answer on a lot of things, whereas the higher you go in an organization, the more gray area there is. And coming to terms with the willingness to have some gray area, knowing that you're not going to be able to have a right or a wrong answer, or sometimes you just need to make a decision, and then eventually you can make another decision when you get more information, yes. if it turns out that you need to uh, course correct. Of course, we recognize that there are some personality characteristics that are potentially unique to, uh, to engineers. But those are some of the things that I would say as engineers move up the chain, working on some of those competencies around decision-making, complex situations where there's no right or wrong, um, and the gray area is an area to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And and of course, being an engineer myself, sometimes we, we get bucketed in a lot of interesting stereotypes, but I think that's really well addressed. You know, how can we take some of those personality traits and how our training impacts our mindset and learn to flex, learn to stretch that, and also uh, watch out for the weaknesses that come when we over-index on those things. So I really 
Good, good tips. Lauren, before I get to the last question, I, I just want to get some other insights because you coach across such a broad spectrum and have helped leaders build incredible careers for so long. So just in terms of a rapid fire, we won't go very deep on these. What are the biggest challenges that people are facing today in getting to the next level in their career that may not have been there 20 years ago when you started this work that people really need to focus on if they're serious about wanting to break through and get to that next level? A relatively interesting new phenomenon is around this concept of remote work right now. So I imagine many of the folks listening right now might still be working full-time from home. And that's great from a lot of convenience perspectives. I love it. I'm, I'm working from home right now. On the other hand, there can be some life balance challenges in both directions. Yes. Uh, you know, you have the flexibility, but then also work is always there with you wherever you are. The area that I think, especially for engineers who might be much more comfortable being heads down in their work is coming back to that network. How are you going to make sure that you're, that you have that visibility in the organization if you're not able to have those water cooler conversations or yes. not able to run into a senior executive in the elevator, for example. That's a great point. The effectiveness of remote work. We're just now starting to see how that it's bigger than just, did you get the project done on time? There's a lot right. of other intangibles that we have happen. So remote work, especially for, especially for young individuals. And yeah. so where you're learning there's a lot to learn early in your career, both on the technical side, as well as on some of the other aspects requiring EQ. Super. Absolutely true. What other challenges are you seeing in coaching people to success these days? You know, I think right now there's also people just wanting to take a pause and reflect. So I don't know whether you're saying we're coming out of COVID or <laughs> continuing with the pandemic, whatever the case may be. I think people have taken the last couple of years to really take stock. And it's an opportunity now for people to take to get some clarity on what is it that I really want? I've been, you know, on this corporate ladder or I've been on the treadmill making my way through. Is this really what I want? Mm. And I don't know if that's really something different. But I think that the time of the pandemic over the last two years has given people the opportunity to take a pause and force that reflection. I've heard that from my clients and from a lot of other folks who've come on this podcast. And I guess time will tell how that continues to evolve and develop and the way people pursue careers and growth. Lauren, this is awesome. I want to continue so much. So many places we could explore and ask. And I know every engineering leader listening is going to want to hear more from you, but just to wrap things up, I really believe your great engineering and great coaching have in common that the questions we ask lead and the answers follow. And so if the engineering leader listening is in pursuit of that growth, they want to take ownership of their career. They want to get to that next level. They want to find that balance and happiness along the way what would be the best question that you would lead them with? I love this. And I am going to, at the risk of sounding a little bit like a broken record here, I'm going to ask about who are the two people, or three, whatever the case may be, but who are the two people that you need to know, that you need to build a relationship with? Because it's not just that you need to actually know, but who are the two to three people that you need to build a relationship with that can help take your career to the next level? Simple, powerful question. Lauren, you've helped thousands of people <laughs> to career breakthrough. And just to hear you say, this really comes down to, do you know who those next two key people are? I love that. So I hope everyone listening takes a moment to seriously answer that question. Lauren, thank you again for being here. Where can people find more about the work that you're doing there at Impact Group and your books and everything else? How can they find you? Where should people go look? 
You can reach out to us at www.impactgrouphr.com or just to make it simple, IGHR.com. Uh, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. It's Lauren Herring. I'm the CEO of Impact Group. So that's how you would find me there. Okay, awesome. And we'll make sure to put links to the website and to Lauren's profile on LinkedIn in the show notes and visit oasisofcourage.com like you always do to, to find those. And Lauren, again, I cannot thank you enough for making time to be here. I hope everyone goes out and buys a copy of your books and checks Thanks. out the work that you're doing and, and gets coaching from Impact Group and Lauren and her team. Cannot recommend highly enough. Just tremendous the value that they create, their expertise and depth of expertise around this area. So thanks again for making time for us and just a, a real blessing. Thanks, Lauren. Great. Thanks, Zach. Hello, my friend. Zach White here again. And I wanted to let you know that's all we've got for this episode of the Happy Engineer podcast. Thank you so much for investing your time with me today. It is an absolute pleasure to be able to bring you this content. Just as a reminder, it would be amazing if you would subscribe and share this episode with any other engineers you know who may benefit from this. And if you're like me, I hope that you'll take some notes and more importantly, take action. In our audio version of the podcast on Apple Podcasts and any place that you go to find podcasts, there's a little more content from me about this episode in the debrief. If you really want to hear about how to put this into action, I'd encourage you to go grab that. But thank you for joining us for the video version of our interview today. And again, can't thank you enough for helping us to get the word out about the Happy Engineer podcast and what we're doing. If there's any way we can serve you, would love to do that. Go find us at oasisofcourage.com or reach out to me on social media at Oasis of Courage. And don't forget again to subscribe and click the bell to have notifications of upcoming releases of new episodes of the podcast. As always, I want to leave you with this. If you stay in your comfort zone, you're not going to grow. So let's crush comfort, create courage, and let's do this.